Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. I know about the uh, success following failure only too well from personal experience. Here we argue that uh, ingenuity can be best understood by applying creative solutions to practical problems by combining a few available resources in a surprising way. The title for today's speech is Problem Solving in a Complex World. But why do I say that the, the world is complex? Well, <clears throat> let me start with an image of a complex object, a toaster. The reason I'm interested in the toaster is because a design student, Thomas Thwaites, launched a project to build this toaster, or the equivalent of this toaster, from scratch. The first thing he did was to buy a toaster at Argos, although other toasters are available, and take it apart to see how it worked. And he discovered to his alarm there are over 400 different components and subcomponents in a toaster. There are a number of different materials. So you've got uh, copper, you've got iron, nickel, mica, which is a sort of material a bit, a bit like slate, that you wrap the heating element around, and of course plastic. You must have plastic, otherwise you don't get the sleek looking casing. There are a number of different materials you need in your toaster. So having taken the toaster apart, Thwaites decided, well, the first thing he needed to do was find iron. So go to an iron mine. We don't have any iron mines in the UK. It's a post-industrial society. So he had to find a substitute for an iron mine. He went to a, a museum of iron mines that was once an iron mine. And in the end, they gave him a suitcase full of iron ore <laughs> to take away with him. So that's fine. But of course, how do you get iron from iron ore? Well, I don't know either. So this was Thomas Thwaites' first effort. This is a very large dustbin. He's got barbecue coals in there, and he, this is a leaf blower to blow oxygen over the coals, trying to get them really, really hot. Um, this didn't work. So the next approach was uh, he discovered there's a recently patented method of smelting iron in a microwave. Now, you, you're already thinking to yourself, well, hang on, the original vision was guy, loincloth, Swiss army knife, He's betraying the purity of his original vision. Well, he had to go through a lot of compromises, to be honest. So, I mean, nickel. Turns out that in the end, Thomas Thwaites got nickel from uh, when well, he bought a Canadian commemorative coin made of nickel. Uh, so that was easy. Um, copper, he derived from the polluted waters of a copper mine in Anglesey via electrolysis. So he's using quite sophisticated methods and materials. Plastic. He discovered you can make plastic from potato starch. The only disadvantage with that is it's edible. So he lost half of that to mold and the other half to snails. And in the end, he got his plastic by basically just melting existing plastic. So he's compromising. He's compromising constantly with the purity of the original vision. And he said to me, look, Tim, if it was just you in a forest with no equipment, no materials, nothing, trying to make a toaster, you could spend your whole life and you still would not have a toaster. These are all the different items Thwaites use. So you can see we've got the, the suitcase full of iron ore, we've got the two microwaves, we've got the leaf blowers and wood and they're, they're all this different stuff. Now, I wouldn't like to say that Thwaites failed to make a toaster. I'm not sure I would like to say that he succeeded either. But imagine you had asked your mother to make you a cake in the shape of a toaster. And imagine that your mother was very drunk. I mean, this, this is a sort of story that economists like to tell about the complexity of the world around us. You know, £3.99, you can buy this toaster in Argos, and it's an awful lot better than the one that it took Thomas Thwaites months and months and many compromises and many shortcuts to produce. And this is a tremendously complex system that is producing items like toasters for us. It's a very decentralized system. Okay, this guy here. So he drives this truck around this, which is the Chiquicamata mine in Chile, one of the biggest open cast copper mines in the world. So this guy drives this truck around and around and around, loaded with copper ore. Now, where's the copper ore going? Uh, is it going in, into a toaster, into telephone cables in China? He doesn't know. He doesn't need to know. He's got his place in this economic system. And he has no idea, ultimately, where the copper is going to go. 
and yet the system works. The system also produces a tremendous variety of products. Traditional hunter-gatherer society, you might have had maybe 300 products. You know, so you've got this kind of flint knife, that kind of flint knife. Now, in today's society, it's tremendously more sophisticated. Just have a guess how many products are served by Starbucks. 85,000. Of course, they cheat, because every time you add a new sort of gloop or new kind of soya milk, you get another a whole big range of products. So maybe fairer to say, well, how, how much in a typical Walmart, how much in a big supermarket? About 100,000 products. Now, Eric Beinhocker, who's a complexity researcher at McKinsey, uh, has been thinking about this and trying to figure out how many products there are uh, in our society. And he reckons in New York or London, a complex economy like that, there are approximately 10 billion distinct types of product and service. So by a distinct type of product and service, I mean you know, something that has a barcode on it. The complexity of this economy that we've surrounded ourselves with is it's just staggering. The market economy is miraculous. It does do amazing things despite being under nobody's control. While it's true, the world clearly isn't a perfect place. We have a lot of very poor people in the world. We have the banking crisis or two. We're worried about climate change. We're right to be worried about climate change. If you actually want to fix the problems that face us, this and the toaster should be terrifying. Because even the simplest problems in this world are complex problems. And complex problems really defy human ingenuity. If you want to make the world a better place, we have to face up to this complexity. And the complexity of the toaster is not only a symbol of how sophisticated our economy is, how sophisticated our society is, it's also a symbol of the obstacles that lie in wait for anybody who wants to improve the world. So what do we do about it? How do we solve problems in the world? Um, well, I mean, one possibility is we just, we just find somebody smart, okay? Find somebody who's smarter than the previous guy. And he'll solve these problems for us. And Obama himself, in his autobiography, says change doesn't come from the top. Change comes from a mobilized grassroots. He knew leaders can only solve so many things. But of course, one thing you could do as a leader is you could hire some really smart people. Oil industry forecasts. So what you used to do in the oil industry is you get a bunch of people together and you get them to tell you what the oil price would be. So in the early 1980s, this was the forecast. Turns out that wasn't a very good forecast, as you can see. So this was the second forecast. Later on, they're, they're, they're getting the idea, and in the end, it sort of settles down, and they finally sort of get somewhere close to the actual results until, of course, this is what the oil price then did. <laughs> so <laughs> basically, expert forecasts are very poor. There's a wonderful piece of research done by Philip Tetlock, psychologist, who studied the efficacy of expert forecasts. And he, he talked to 300 experts, and he collected nearly 30,000 forecasts, and he did something very mean which is he waited for 20 years to see whether the forecast came true, which is something we don't do often enough. And <clears throat> he didn't only look at the correct forecast, he looked at all the wrong forecasts as well. It wasn't just the economists who got things wrong. It was political scientists, psychologists, sociologists, historians. It was academics, but it was also diplomats, journalists, spies, think tankers. It was basically every social scientist, both you know, theoretical and applied, attempted to make these forecasts and you're basically, your predictive record was about as good as this guy. And the message there, for me, is not a message about why you shouldn't trust experts. It's a message about the complexity of the world. You know, we, we don't know what will happen. We can't figure out the future. We can't figure out how well our brilliant policies and our brilliant plans are going to pan out. So, okay, so how do we think about problem solving in a complex world? Let's think about a problem that we've solved. Okay, I put it to you that we have solved the problem of material affluence in the Western world. I'm not saying the market uh, you know, fixes everything. I'm not saying we don't have recessions. We clearly have many problems. But the basic problem of food on the table, shelter, clothes, Western civilization has basically nailed it. What's the secret? How did that problem get solved? Clearly, business people were involved. You know, we have a market economy. So I ask business people a secret, and they tell me, well, the reason, is, the reason that we've solved all these problems is because businesses are run by very, very smart people. Um, yeah, maybe. I'm not so sure. Here's what I think is going on. Tom Peters, Robert Waterman, In Search of Excellence, one of the most popular business books of all time, uh, nearly 30 years old now. Peters and Waterman looked at 43 excellent 
American companies. They looked at their R&D policies and the way they were financially structured and their human resources and their management structure, basically the template for every management book ever written. And it was hugely successful. Three years later, one third of these businesses were under severe financial stress, and many of them went bankrupt. It just took three years for nearly a third of these, not just any old companies, but the excellent companies, the very best companies, to be on the brink of financial ruin. What's going on here is what always goes on in markets, which is failure is absolutely endemic. You can pick the best companies you like, and some of them will fail. Here are the titans of 99 years ago. And you will recognize some of these names, but a lot of these other companies, you won't recognize the names, or you'll recognize them only as sort of museum pieces. Pullman, you know, the railway car guys, what happened to them? American Tobacco, they've gone. International Harvester, who were they? U.S. Steel, no longer um, part of the top 500 companies in the world. Many of these companies, and there's a list of 100 assembled by the business historian Leslie Hanna, many, many, many of these companies have gone bankrupt. And I would argue that the market succeeds not despite these failures, but because of these failures. It's an evolutionary process. It's a trial and error process. The process of economic growth is a process of replacing bad ideas with better ideas. That's what's going on. Johannes Gutenberg, in a way, the man who created the modern world, created the movable type printing press, and made possible all the books that we love around us every day, this book bankrupted Johannes Gutenberg. He got into debt. It turns out there's not a big market for Bibles. You know, people want, um, well, people want Bibles, but they want you know, organic, handwritten, monk-stitched Bibles. They don't want mass-produced, sort of Walmart, genetically modified Bibles. So it turns out producing a printed Bible at tremendous expense is not a very good business model. And Gutenberg went out of business. And many printing companies at the beginning of the printing industry also went out of business. In the end, they stumbled upon the the way to make money, and papal indulgences. So a letter from the Pope that says you get into heaven. You buy this from the Catholic Church. It's a, you know, it was a great business for the medieval church. And when you think about it, you think, of course, of course. Every single one is the same. It just needs a papal seal. Nobody cares what the thing looks like, and it has a very high value because it gets you into heaven. So it was a perfect business, but there was this process of experimentation, and a lot of businesses had to go uh, out of business, including the creator of the movable type printing press, before we have this success. This is a real problem for us, though, because it's very, very easy for me to say trial and error is really important. We need to experiment. We need to learn from our mistakes. Uh, we need to try a bunch of things out, like the market does. I'm not saying that the market should rule everywhere. What I'm saying is we need institutions which, like the market, are capable of experimenting and learning failing and building on that failure and turning it into success. The trouble is, we don't want these institutions. We want our institutions to be like Andy Warhol's Coca-Cola. Remember this famous statement? You can drink Coke too. A Coke is a Coke, and no amount of money can get you a better Coke than the one the bum on the corner is drinking. All the Cokes are the same, and all the Cokes are good. And that is what we want from our NHS hospitals, that is what we want from our schools. We want them all to be the same and all to be good. And we can't have that because they're more complicated than Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola is a solved problem. This is why Andy Warhol thought it was so interesting. They can't be the same and good. We can make them the same, but if we make them the same, we cannot learn, we cannot experiment, we cannot build on failures and turn them into successes. We can't adapt. But we want them to all be the same. Trial and error is the most effective problem-solving technique we have in a complex world. It seems to me, having looked at the financial crisis, having looked at the war in Iraq, having looked at our response to climate change, uh, development in Africa, innovation, again and again and again, it seems to me this is the only way that pro complex problems actually get solved. When you look at the problem that we really have solved, the, the affluence problem, it's been solved by a trial and error process. We are not comfortable with trial and error. We don't want to see our politicians engage in trial and error. We don't want them to experiment. We don't want to tolerate failure. And we're, we're not comfortable with it in our personal lives either. So that's my challenge to, to all of us, to the politicians in this country, and to ourselves, and anybody in an institution. How do we increase our failure rate? How do we learn from our mistakes? I'm not saying that failure is a wonderful thing. I'm just saying it's completely unavoidable. And if it's unavoidable, the mark of success is not avoiding failure, it's how quickly you can learn from that failure, 
adjust and adapt. I mean, as a businessman, I've spent almost a quarter of a century uh, frequently failing, and um, I find that one of the aspects that helps is, is terminology. So when I give speeches about this sort of subject, I use words like mistakes or setbacks. Uh, and, and you used the word earlier, bankruptcy, which is a very negative word. But actually, I looked at that chart of the top 10 or 12 companies, and the assets of all of them, save two, are either still around or been completely recycled into a different business. And the point about virtually all bankruptcies is they're not actually the end at all. They're just a restructuring. Yeah, many economic historians think that uh, limited liability corporations were you know, hugely important innovation in spurring uh, economic growth. When you think about what, what is limited liability, it's, it's a set of rules about what happens when the business has failed. 